think in my kindergarten, age like four, I remember one of the, the best drawing I did when I was four year, uh, years old was like the Christmas tree. So when all my friends draw just yes, a Christmas tree, I draw like Christmas tree and all these, you know, presents underneath, Santa Claus in it and everything. I remember that my parents supported me very well, so they, they called a drawing teacher for me. At that time, they always knew that Tex always draws in the school. He doesn't really listen to the, you know, the class. So one of the teachers, because of him, maybe she fed up, <laughs> she said, you know, why don't you just go to fashion school? It's a good, it's a good input for me. My sister uh, was, she's, yeah, she's the one who, I remember that moment, it was in her, in her bed, in her room. I was drawing on her bed. <laughs> so, and she came to me, what are you doing in my bed? Drawing, she saw, and I said, if I were you, I will go to fashion school. And then she left. <laughs> so at that moment, I was like, mm, you're right, okay, but then, okay, and then, Think about it. And my, my teacher knew that I, I have a talent in drawing. I always stand for the you know every every um, drawing competition. So that's where I started, you know, try to draw mangas. And then after that I, I remember there's this one uh, mangas very popular at that time, uh, called uh, Ross of Arsales just because of that manga. So, uh, yeah, then I realized that it's so, I, I, I enjoyed it so much when I draw dresses. And I think that's where I realized that fashion is my passion. I talk, I discuss with, you know, of course, my parents first, and then I said, um, I want to go to fashion school. <laughs> I knew that this is my, you know, it's like a calling for me, so. Uh, and surprisingly, I was so surprised that my parents said, oh, well, if you, if you are so sure about it, then go ahead. But you have to make sure that it's not just, you know, just for a moment, you need to make sure that you do it like 100%. And because I have this support from my parents, I go, of course, I, uh, I was so happy and then, uh, okay, let's do this. And um, from that day, I started, you know, doing short course, fashion, uh, go into fashion schools and then competition, fashion competition. And then in 2010, I, yeah, the first show, I, I do a co co collective show with um, my fellow designers friends. And, uh, and then the story goes on with Gaga, Hunger Games, Kim Kardashian, I even was again. I'm here now. <laughs> what makes me a little bit different than any other designer? Because when I design, when I sketch, or when I sketch, I don't just think about the clothes. I think about the attitude of the of the you know of the. the it's like it's just the total look, the character. So when I design this, I I imagine that the woman who wears this, the attitude is like this. The way she moves, the body language, and everything is just like. I'm, I'm creating, I'm, I'm not creating just a clothes, I'm creating a, a character, a personality, and the clothes is actually is part of it. We put it like a fashion presentation, because for me it's more than just a show, where you know, I, I gotta show the, the collection. I wanna see people, to, I want people to see the, the character of text. I want, I want to make a clothes that empowers women. I want to, when when woman when a woman wears a piece of text, they they kind of like empowered. They feel like they're they're becoming like their better self. For me, I just see it as a. You know, I see a lot of talent in Indonesia, creative talent especially, and uh, we are not really exposed to the global stage, I think, then I just think that we need a platform to do that, and I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to have that, you know, support to showcase all this creativity 
talents, creative talents in Indonesia. So I just think that let's do this. It's a platform from for all of us. So why not? When people want to see it, let's just give it. <laughs> so now that people know, people have you know expectation on me. So I just feel like okay, let's do something special for them. Let's give something special for for them. I want a video presentation. I want you know huge screen. The video itself, it takes about six months to make. I try to learn new stuff, try to understand their language. Um, for for the lighting, I said that I don't want to, I don't want it to look flat. I want people to see the contrast. I want people to see the depth. I want people to see the, you know, it it moves. When you, when we talk about. Uh, you know, giving someone support from the back. We we want people to change, to transform into a better self. It's not a, we don't need to be perfect, but we just want to support them to be a better person. Well, I can say like the 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 you know the younger generation of Indonesia, the the new the comer, newcomer of you know creative talent in Indonesia. It's mm, I I just don't say it as okay just because you are Indonesian you have to dress like Indonesian you have to wear batik all the time you have to present batik wherever you go and then you have to present batik in your runway or in your works I just think that it's not about that it's more like how do you bring the message how do you how do you become a you know an inspiration that people know that oh when people see text they see Indonesia. He represents Indonesia, and you know, on on his field, I always I have a, like a magic wand where I can just you know turn my what goes in my mind into a reality so easily. So there's a lot of things that I wish that I could do more. Like even like after the show, I always that there's there's certain parts that I feel like in my fantasy it should be like this. It should be more like this than this. But of course, in reality. There are things that we cannot, you know, we cannot change. So I feel like, but up to this moment, I'm very grateful that most of it, like I can say, like said, seventy percent of what I fantasize about is coming true. As it was, I was already really into music. One thing that I remember is that I was not happy that my parents put me in boarding school. They just left me there. You know, when my my mom come to see me, and so I, I, I tell my mom, yeah, buy me this headphone. It was like the best one I can find, right? And she felt so bad that she about that that she bought it for me. I kind of amassed this collection of like weird stuff that I would listen to every night because my headphones were so good. Listening to music as just music, but also sounds. You know, it was it was an atmosphere. And that time I saw the UFO. <laughs> we see this light coming out of the hills, and then it went over our boarding school. But after that, I was, I was like, you know, this. I mean, this is this thing that we saw that was really real, and I wanted to know more about things, things that are like new to me and interesting and strange, even, you know. Um, and so that kind of also shaped me a bit. And, and with that, with the headphones, with the music, and everything. You know, in, in boarding school, there'd be nights where people come and there'd be pillow fights. So I get my seniors coming to me one night, and uh, like in front of my bed, and I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna get beat up," you know. But they didn't beat me up. They're, they're like, "Oh, can you, uh, you know help help us DJ the, the boarding house dance?" It became like a discipline every night that I, you know, that I, I wanted to listen to new music every time. You know, I was just really interested in new music, uh, good music, and you know things that put me in this kind of mood. I really was a strange kid, that, you know. I was having a hard time trying to fit in with uh, people of different cultures and everything else. And then actually, you know, after that, I moved to the States uh, for high school. And again, it was the same thing where 
you know, it was a school of mostly people that was not accustomed to, uh, confident enough to be amongst them. You know, I had to, I had to kind of prove myself, and you had to be among like the cool kids. Yeah, for me, it was it was difficult. Music was always my escape. So there were record stores that were selling records for 99 cents, and you can find anything that you can imagine. You know, I kept myself busy just digging for 90, 99 cent uh, records that I thought was just super interesting. And then I discovered the whole uh, underground electronic music scene, like the underground rave scene. It was in San Francisco, but it was very much a, a, about nature. You know, a lot of the events were kind of outdoors. Uh, where you know, when the sun comes up, there's really good music going on. My sister and my friends sneak me into clubs because you have to be 20, 21 up. I just grew my stash a bit. I'd just be by the DJ booth, right? And I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Like, this guy is controlling the music in this room with a few hundred people, and he's, he's building the atmosphere of the night through music. He can play anyone's music, and, you know, and he puts it in sequence that I was doing before. He puts it in the sequence where he creates this crazy energy of people having a good time and makes so many people happy. So that really inspired me. I had a team of, a team of friends that became like business partners. I said, you know, well, yeah, a couple of us put money in. Uh, we did our first uh, rave, kind of our first underground party. We, we picked an airport hangar. So we promoted it and we made flyers. We named it Escape. That night we had about 5,000 people inside this airplane hangar. Actually that night I, I played in my own event. My thing was I wanted to be a DJ, so a good way was like if I did my own event, people would notice me. And maybe I would get booked and I did get booked. You know, yeah, I was doing the raves there, I was DJing quite a lot actually, I was playing. Then, then uh, there was this one event that was like the event, right? I mean, if, if you were a DJ, only the best DJs could play that event. But then I had to come back, because yeah, to help out my family and all that. I had to come back to Indonesia. I didn't even wink, I, you know, I came back. I found out I could actually make money from what I love doing. And so my first thing was I just knocked on a few doors and uh, to clubs and said, you know, can I play? I got on and got kicked out within an hour. I was playing music that was not right for here. So I gave up and I said, okay, I have to do what I did before. It was kind of do my own thing. And so I seeked out a, 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 an empty space. So I got that, you know, that, that space every week. So I could, I was making money every week. So I could hire on people and stuff like that. I was building up a, a, a following of, of people. I had the crowd, I had, you know, the trust. We built up a community and people could see in and we could see that and they're like, wow. All the cool kids are at his party. And so we get uh, companies knocking on my door saying, hey, could you uh, do events for us? So, so that they could actually then grab this market that was hard to get, right? It was really hard to get. And one other thing I learned from uh, music is, is actually community. Yeah, the, the community is important in the, in the kind of promotion um, for music at that time. And then for brands now, for me. Um, you know, music, uh, you, have, you don't have customers, you have following, right? You have fan clubs, you have following. Um, and I think that's the best kind of marketing ever. Because that then your core following will then promote you to their friends. So it's the best kind of referral of all. I thought I could do more with retail because I saw the potential in, in in this country and the des designers and brands and everything else. Because there was nothing here that was interesting in terms of being able to buy things or at that time even being able to eat uh, good food, like interesting food and interesting places. And so that's why we're in, in retail we're a multi-brand. You know, we're a collection of 350 and more counting, more, more brands. And, and that's why we could then offer people things that are new but also interesting for them. I mean, there's, there's a few kind of uh, things that are uniquely, or which, which I think is kind of very Indonesian with the, with the concept that we do. I mean, this, this view, I mean, being a multi-brand, it's, it's like a bit of like going to a pasar, yeah, a market where people can come and buy different things. And, and then there is, there's no category boundary. If 
I'm anywhere in the world, I'm, I will still be Indonesian. People actually booked me in, in the States to DJ because I was Indonesian. And so I learned that I, it could be that, that was my difference. And it could be my different take on, on, on what I do right? back then with music and here with, with, with what I do now. Our teacher asked every one of us what uh, did we want to be when we grew up. Plain as the stars at night. When she asked other kids, they said, I want to be an architect. But when she asked me, I said, I want to be an actor. And my brother just burst in laughter. So when, when, I, when he woke me home, he... Um, he hit my, uh, he tapped my, my, my head and he said, you can't be a film actor because you're not handsome. And it really broke my heart. And I ran to, the, to, to my house and I met my, my mom. My mom was um, cooking eggplant. I, I remember it very, very clearly. I, she, was, she was cooking eggplant with chabai, with chili, whatever. And I was crying and I said, mom, mom, uh, brother said uh, I couldn't be an actor because uh, I'm not handsome. And you know what my mom said? Because I was expecting my mom would say, you are very handsome, very cute, right? But my mom said, but you're not ugly either. My father taught me for years to be a strong man, hold back my tears. I grew up in a very screwed up neighborhood. I escaped to a cinema. It's called Remaja Theater. They played Kung Fu flicks and horror films, but they also uh, screen cuts from uh, censored films since they are cut out from, from by censors. One of these projectionists called Pak Uchok, he saw me and he asked me to come to the projectionist room. And um, he let me watch from the thingy. Lah. So it was like it was like in, in a film. It was very beautiful. And it was such a different world of its own. It's 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 very far away from real life, and uh, that was my universe. My family was quite hated <laughs> in that village. I don't actually mingle with, 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 with the kids there, but when I did, it was when I told them stories. So. If they played soccer, and after they finished soccer, I just sat on the side of the field or something, and you know they would gather there, and I would I would tell them stories, stories that I make up at that time, because you know when when you when first time you told them something, and they get interested, and I thought oh I have to come up with more stories, you know. A film doesn't even have to have a story. <laughs> but as long as it can give people experience in each shot, people can be immersed in the universe and people can believe the characters and the world that the characters inhabit. That's enough. In 2001 or two, I lost my faith in love 
and I lost the joy of watching films. But when I saw this film, my faith in movies and my faith in love reinstalled because it's very powerful. I think so. It's my favorite movie of all time, Punch Drunk Love. Very disconnected <laughs> as a storytelling. Even the story are very disjointed, but you got the feel of the film. You kind of suck into the most into the the universe of the of the of the story. And this movie told me that there is no one way to tell stories. It kind of saddened me when when the people said, if you are an Indonesian, you have to make films that look and feel like Indonesians. I mean, how do you how do you do that? There is so many things about a country, right? And everybody is unique, and um, you cannot conform to other people's way to tell stories. And I was looking at the sky. I was five or six, and I, and I did not know the concept of UFO at the time. What I saw was a very thick cloud, and it's not very far above me. And <laughs> from inside this cloud, there was this ship. I was very shocked. I ran to my uh, mom, who was also cooking um, eggplant. <laughs> my mom cooked a lot of eggplant. <laughs> if not eggs, it's eggplants, okay? <laughs> because they were poor. She just cooked egg or eggplants, that's it. <laughs> With chili. <laughs> so. I ran to my mom, I was very hysterical, I said, oh, there was a ship, there was a ship, there was a ship. Mama, ada kapal, ada kapal. And my mom said, what kapal? Kapal apa, kapal apa? Di mana, di mana? I said, di langit, di langit. And she got very irritated and she smacked my face. I fell down. And you know what happened? I saw that a trail of blood from outside to inside. And my one of my fingers, my toe, is wounded and it left it left a scar and even now the scar is still here it's shaped like this really? very no, geometrical this I'm not making this up I can show you we're not playing football you know <laughs> we're not playing football you don't have to impress on your stories <laughs> no, no, no. No, no. I can show you I can show you the scar yeah there could be a cover somewhere no no it's from it's from my childhood. I swear, I swear. Uh. <laughs>